you know, we're going to discuss some aspects of um, biotechnology and molecular genetic analysis, from chapter 19. And here's an outline. We'll, after introducing the topic, we'll talk about restriction enzymes, polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, gene cloning, DNA libraries, and gene therapy, lastly. So here's a transgenic tobacco plant. It has had the gene for bioluminescence from a firefly, which is really a beetle, not a fly, put into it and engineered in such a way that when the plant gets low on water, it will um, start to glow. So you may have heard of GFP or green fluorescent protein. Well, here's its source uh, from a jellyfish and it's been put into a lot of different organisms that can then uh, fluoresce green under UV light. So you see up right there, a green fruit fly, then the roundworm, Cenorhabditis elegans, and a fish, and left three different mammals, rabbits, mice, and monkeys. Your textbook says that about 92% of corn grown today in the United States is genetically modified to kill pests. They've taken a gene from bacteria that produces a toxin, and put it in the corn plant and the plant will um, express that toxin and not be eaten by the moth larvae or caterpillars that uh, typically cause problems for uh, corn growers. So then genetic engineering results in transgenic organisms. These are organisms that contain a gene or genes from uh, other species. And they're often referred to as GMOs for genetically modified organisms. But this is not accomplished through selective breeding like in the past, but it's done in a lab by moving individual genes from one organism to another. So the first one was that was at least commercially feasible was in 1982. That's the year I graduated from college. They took human insulin gene and put it in E. coli and then grew up uh, E. coli, and they were able to produce uh, human insulin. Before that, I guess they got insulin from slaughterhouses, from uh, cattle and pigs and so forth. And then in 1985, the year I got my master's degree, the human growth hormone gene was done in a similar way, put in E. coli and grown in big vats, and they E. coli produced, uh, I guess, copious amounts of the human growth hormone molecule that can be used medically then. So, and of course, part of this process involved restriction enzymes, which are endonucleases. Remember, endonucleases cut the sugar phosphate backbone of the DNA molecule. And each of these enzymes has a recognition site, kind of like a word in the DNA that it's looking for, and that's where it cuts the uh, DNA. And they come from bacteria, so the enzymes are named from the species of bacteria that they come from. So, for instance, an enzyme called ECHOR1 came from E. coli, strain RY13, and the 1 means that it was the first enzyme isolated from E. coli. So, this shows um, several different uh, restriction enzymes, their name, what bacterium they come from, what their recognition site is. So, for instance, our buddy Echo R1 there, it's G A A T T C, and it cuts between the G and the first A. So, the little arrows under recognition sequence show where it cuts. Now, cohesive means that the ends are overhanging and therefore sticky ends. Uh, a couple of them, though, produce blunt ends, and therefore it's not so easy to anneal another DNA sequence to that. Talk about that later. So the enzyme Hindi 3 then with the recognition site AAGCTT cuts between the A's and produces these uh, overhangs or sticky ends. And if we um, put them together with another DNA molecule cut with Hindi 3, they, will, they should naturally anneal and then we can close them up with DNA ligase. Then the enzyme PVU2 cuts in the middle of its um, recognition sequence producing blunt ends and you really can't attach anything to blunt ends so something needs to be done to those blunt ends to make them um, overhanging or uh, sticky ends. So this shows a close-up of the Aquar 1 restriction site and again it cuts between the G and the A leaving these complementary tails. So 
the native function of restriction enzymes is to cleave foreign DNA like that from viruses that is injected into the bacteria. So I kind of think of it as the immune system of the microorganism and the uh, bacteria's own DNA is rapidly methylated following replication so that the uh, enzymes don't uh, attack it and cut it up. So restriction sites themselves tend to be four to eight base pairs in length. The palindromic and madam DNA, a palindrome is something spelled forwards and backwards the same way. And again, they produce, many of them produce staggered cuts, but not all of them. And then DNA ligase uh, is then necessary to bond the um, uh, different restriction fragments together. RF stands for restriction fragment. And that just means the uh, piece of DNA generated by the restriction enzymes. So this shows restriction fragments, four of them, generated by cutting a circular DNA molecule with Hindi, four, with Hindi 3. Excuse me, there's four sites there. And um, each one of these restriction fragments then is uh, labeled A, B, C, and D. So that's all I've got in restriction enzymes. And we'll come back to them again when we discuss cloning. But the polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, was invented in 1984 by this guy, Kerry Mullis, who was born in North Carolina and went to high school at Dreer High School in Columbia, South Carolina. So he was South Carolina's old Nobel Prize winner, but then went out after college to uh, California to get his PhD in biochemistry. And um, basically, PCR is DNA replication in a tube, and it utilizes a a heat resistant form of DNA polymerase that came, comes from the bacterium Thermus aquaticus that lives in hot springs naturally. So the enzyme isn't destroyed by heating at high temperatures. And Mullis got the Nobel Prize for this in 1993. And so there he is. I guess he's deceased now though. So the components of a PCR reaction then include the sequence to be modified called the target sequence, then the primers, the short sequences that flank the region to be um, copied, and then the DNA, and then of course the nucleotide, nucleotides which exist as triphosphates when they're not incorporated into the DNA molecule. Usually each reaction has to have three steps to it. Step one is heating the DNA to make it single-stranded. That's what denaturing means. Secondly, we drop the temperature to usually the mid-60s or maybe even cooler for the annealing of the primers to the single-stranded DNA. And then thirdly, raise the temp back up to 72 degrees C, which is the best temperature for TAC polymerase to then synthesize new DNA strands. And normally we do about 30 cycles uh, and each step takes about 30 seconds. So in one afternoon, just a couple of hours, you can get lots and lots of copies of DNA from a very uh, few molecules to begin with. And this kind of shows you how that works. Heating the DNA makes it single-stranded. Cooling back down somewhere between 30 to 65 allows the little primers to anneal. Remember the primers have the OH, three prime OH necessary for the tag polymerase to add more molecules to. I mean, more nucleotides too, excuse me. And then the uh, synthesis of the new DNA, and then you heat it again, cool it, heat it, cool it. And so this is repeated 30 to 32 times usually. And in a few hours, you can get almost billions of copies of DNA molecules when you start off with a small amount. So here's the habitat for the bacterium thermus aquaticus, these hot springs in places like Yellowstone National Park, where the water is naturally uh, 70 plus degrees C, very, very hot. PCR has been used so widely and it's also been modified. There's qPCR, quantitative PCR, there's reverse transcription PCR, and real-time PCR. So these are all variations on the basic PCR theme or polymerase chain reaction theme. PCR can be used for a lot of things as well. Like in forensics, you just get a tiny bit of, of tissue or fluid at a crime scene that could have some DNA in it, and that can be amplified enough to study that DNA and figure out where it came from. It can be used in paternity tests, evolutionary studies, DNA sequencing, 
and the cloning of genes, which is what we're going to talk about next. So PCR is extremely important. Probably every lab that works with DNA around the world does PCR. Now, let's discuss how we clone a gene. So we take a gene of interest and put it in a small cell for replicating molecule. That'll be a recombinant DNA molecule at that point. And then we take this molecule and put it into a host cell. And then as the host cell grows and reproduces, it makes more copies of the gene for us. And um, sometimes the gene will be expressed too, like with the human insulin and so forth. So it's a three-step process. So first of all, removing the gene of interest requires restriction enzymes, restriction endonucleases. And then we construct a common DNA molecule that's that's done by putting our gene into a cloning vector, and then we introduce that cloning vector into the host cell somehow, which is normally a bacterial cell, but not always. So this shows us we cut DNA from two sources with the same restriction enzyme. In this case, it's echo R1. They leave these complementary tails and you mix them together and they, if you drop the temperature a bit, they naturally anneal and then you can fill the gaps in there with some DNA ligase and voila, now we have a, a recombinant DNA molecule. And this shows you that, you know, the restriction enzymes um, often generate these overhanging ends. So here we've cut our uh, gene for the uh, beta globin in uh, mice out of the native DNA in purple there. We've cut open our um, Cosmid PJB8 with the same restriction enzyme, mixed them together and added some DNA ligase, and voila, now we have a recombinant DNA molecule there, our plasmid with our mouse gene in it. And now we have to get the plasmid into a some kind of cell, usually E. coli, and as the E. coli grows and divides, it will make copies of the plasmid for us with our uh, mouse gene in it. So the definition of a DNA, recombinant DNA molecule is just a molecule that contains DNA from two different sources, like the cosmid and the mouse gene at the previous slide. So let's discuss these vectors. One set of vectors are called plasmids. These are small circular DNA molecules naturally found in bacteria, often contain antibiotic resistance genes and range from four to 6,000 base pairs in size. Then we also can use the lambda phage as the DNA molecule from a bacteriophage. Larger circular molecules called cosmids can hold um, inserts up to 15,000 base pairs. And um, Artificial chromosomes can accept very large inserts, and shuttle vectors work in more than one organism, say E. coli and yeast or something. So this shows some of the characteristics of commonly used vectors, table right out of your textbook. So here's what you want in a vector. So it must contain uh, its own origin of replication. It's shown on the left there in green. Let's see if I can get this, yeah the ORI. Secondly, it must contain some kind of selective marker, either antibiotic resistance gene in bacteria or some kind of marker that gives it some color so you can tell if the cells have been uh, modified or not. And then it needs uh, several um, restriction enzyme uh, recognition sites engineered into it so we can cut it open with the um, restriction enzyme that we use to generate our um, gene from its native source. So this shows the top bacterial cell with no plasmid, middle bacterial cell with a plasmid, and the bottom of bacterial cell with a recombinant plasmid where that little orange section in the plasmid is the gene that we've, uh, that the scientists have put in there. And this shows the steps in um, creating a recombinant DNA molecule or putting the gene of interest this in this time, it's uh, this yellow, thing, cut again with echo R1, then we cut our plasmid with echo R1 and mix the two together with DNA ligase and voila, you get um, recombinant DNA molecules. Here's a plasmid called PUC19. It's got its ORI, it's got its ampicillin resistance gene on the lower left there. <coughs> Excuse me. 
And then the polylinker region is where we insert our gene of interest. And that's blown up to show that there are several uh, restriction enzyme uh, recognition sites engineered into that so that um, we can cut it open with uh, many different uh, enzymes if we need to. A lambda phage, we know the entire 48,500 base pair sequence of it. The central third of genes uh, can be pulled away, removed, and uh, our gene of interest can be put in there. It can take inserts up to 23,000 base pairs in size. So whole mitochondrial DNA molecules, for instance, can go in there. And transduction then is the process where the bacteriophage inserts its DNA into the cell. So here's the uh, lambda phage chromosome. These non-essential genes from the middle can be removed and genes that we want to put in there, shown in orange here, can be inserted in there. And then the virus can be reconstituted and will inject its DNA into a bacterial cell for us. And then as the bacterial cell, cells divide, they'll make copies of the gene of interest for us. So cosmids are vectors that can hold larger inserts, up to 45,000 base pairs in size. They contain the uh, ability to replicate autonomously. They're sort of like a hybrid of plasmids and lambda phage. They also contain antibiotic resistance genes. Here's a plasmid PJB8, showing you it's got a polylinker region at the top, origin of replication lower left, and then an ampicillin resistance gene for a, a selectable marker on the upper left there. That's the artificial chromosomes. Yaks are yeast artificial chromosomes. They can handle very large inserts, up to 500,000 uh, base pairs in size. These are genetically modified yeast mini chromosomes. Mini chromosomes are just tiny chromosomes that look like dots under the microscope. But they contain all the things that a, a, a cloning vector needs, an origin of replication, a selectable marker, the poly cloning site, and of course being a eukaryotic chromosome, it's got a centromere and telomeres. And this shows the YAC cloning vector, TEL are the telomeres, CEN is the centromere. Uh, the polycloning site is shown in black there. The URA3 plus is a selectable marker. And then the ARS is the origin of uh, autonomous replication. BACs are bacterial artificial chromosomes. They're made from bacterial fertility factors, which are circular molecules involved in bacterial sexual reproduction. They're less complex than yaks, so they're easier to make. And like yaks, they can accept a large insert. And they replicate in E. coli, just like other vectors. Now, shuttle vectors can operate in more than one type of uh, host cell. There are unique cloning vectors available for yeast, fruit flies, plants, and mammals. But shuttle vectors, the same vector can be used in, say, yeast and bacteria both, which uh, makes it very convenient. This shows that the vector there, it's got an ampicillin resistance gene, which is a um, selectable marker for E. coli, a leucine 2 plus gene, which, a yeast, which is a yeast selectable marker. It's got its E. coli origin replication and yeast origin replication. And then in black on top there is the uh, cloning site, right where the uh, cursor is pointing. So we've been yakking about vectors for a while. Let's summarize them then. Plasmids can take small molecules, lambda phage larger one, cosmids even larger ones, artificial chromosomes can take very large inserts, and shuttle vectors can go into more than one organism. So now, getting the vector into the cell, usually a bacterial cell, let's talk about how bacteria take up DNA from the environment. So transformation is uh, how plasmids get into um, bacterial cells. Transduction is how we get them in with lambdaphage and cosmids, where a virus injects the DNA into the cell. And then, of course, sexual reproduction in bacteria is called conjugation, where they exchange uh, genetic material. Uh, that's not normally used so much in gene cloning, but transformation and transduction certainly are. So in transformation, you need to make the bacterial cell membrane permeable to the DNA in a process called electroporation or hitting it with 
hitting the cells with short pulses of electricity or with chemicals can cause the uh, pores to form in the um, cell membranes. And then uh, in your vector, there needs to be a selectable marker, either an antibiotic resistance gene or a gene that produces some kind of color when it's in the cell, so we know that the, which cells have been transformed and which have not. So this shows you the process of bacterial transformation where the donor DNA, that would be our vectors, attached to the surface and then gets into the cell via electro, uh, electroporation, for instance, and then it's incorporated into the uh, bacterial chromosome sometimes, or sometimes not, or it can be degraded. So transformation isn't always successful, of course. So this kind of reviews the gene cloning process from start to finish. We take our um, gene of interest, in this case, that purple uh, DNA fragment, and put it in our uh, circular cloning vector, the orange round molecule, and then introduce it into a host cell. And then we grow the host cells, and they produce more copies of the DNA for us. And this shows you the past slides reviewing the cloning process from start to finish. Now DNA libraries. A genomic library is a set of DNA clones containing the entire genome of an organism. The chromosome specific library is a clone of a specific chromosome, say chromosome four from uh, humans or something. And then most, uh, probably most widely used are complementary DNA libraries or cDNA libraries because these include only the functional genes. And as we'll see, most of our genome is not genes. It's just DNA that doesn't appear to do anything. So a, G, a good genomic library though contains uh, all the DNA of the organism of interest, which is fairly doable for a bacterium, but quite difficult for a, a vertebrate, for instance, with our huge genomes. So we have to isolate the total DNA from the organism of interest, digest it with restriction enzymes, and then insert these restriction fragments into appropriate cloning vectors, and then of course introduce them into some kind of cell like a bacterial cell. So again, this is more cloning. How many clones will we need? Well, of course, the, the genomic library has all the sequences in the genome of interest, and uh, we can use this cool little formula where n is our number of clones, F is the fraction of the genome, and the average size clones, and P is the probability of a clone containing a certain DNA sequence. So it's N equals the natural log of one minus P over the natural log of one minus F. And if we plug in some real numbers, say we're gonna do a Cosmid library of the entire fruit fly genome. That genome is about 10 to the five kilobases in size, not really very large for a eukaryote. The average clone holds about 40,000 base pairs. And so we plug that in, we'll need 11,513 clones. So that's a lot. That would probably take you six months of full-time work in the lab, assuming no major setbacks. So it's a lot of work. And again, a lot of uh, eukaryotic genome doesn't code for anything. So people really rely more on complementary DNA libraries, cDNA libraries. And so here we harvest the messenger RNAs, and then from that, using reverse transcriptase, we make uh, DNA sequences from them. So RNA and DNA, had a duplex is converted to double-stranded DNA. Uh, an enzyme called ribonuclease degrades the H, degrades the uh, RNA template. And then this leaves little fragments that act as primers. And the DNA polymerase one can come in and synthesize the new DNA strand and replace the RNA primers with DNA, sort of like lagging strand synthesis. And then DNA ligase, of course, seals up the, the NICs. So, and then the double-stranded complementary DNA can be inserted into plasmids or lambda phages clo for cloning vectors. So let's look at the process. We can take our message RNAs, run them through one of these evolution columns with these cellulose beads that have these poly T ligamers sticking off. And remember our poly A tails on the messenger RNA. The messenger RNA here is shown as the light, the light green molecules. And here in this lower circle, 
the messenger RNA has um, bound to the beads. And so now we can wash out the messenger RNA from this elution column, collect them, and then using reverse transcriptase, make um, a DNA uh, messenger RNA hybrid. Using RNA, so we degrade most of the RNA, leaving little bits there acting as primers, and then DNA polymerase can come in and uh, remove the primers, fill in the gaps, DNA ligase then closes up the NICs, and voila, we've got double-stranded DNA made from messenger RNA that is just genes and not all the other stuff in between the genes. And this shows those last few slides all in the same slide. Lastly, gene therapy. This is the direct transfer of genes into humans to treat disease like genetic disorders or maybe cancer or infectious disease. It began in 1990 and the problems with it have been uh, the patient's immune response to the vectors and sometimes the gene products of proteins that the gene makes. So it's, it's been difficult to find appropriate vectors that work right and don't trigger an immune response. People have died from immune responses to the vectors. And this little table shows you these various vectors and their advantages and disadvantages. For instance, the second one down, adenovirus, these are like cold viruses. So they're, uh, they can transfer into non-dividing cells, but then they cause us an immune reaction. And you can read this yourself and figure out the uh, positive and negative aspects of each type of vector. And that's it for this uh, unit.